The solid waste charging scheme indefinitely postponed. Leaders of China, Japan and South Korea meet for the first three-way talks in four years. And former Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Hua Chunying named the nation's vice foreign minister. Hello and welcome to TVB News. The government announced that the municipal solid waste charging scheme will not be implemented on August 1st. There is also no timeline released on when or whether the scheme will be rolled out again. The administration stressed waste reduction campaigns are long-term efforts and it will report the government's relevant work after one year. Jackie Lin with details. The government today announced it will put the citywide municipal solid waste charging scheme on hold. That's after 20 years of deliberations and two delays amid concerns from various sectors. Deputy Chief Secretary for Administration Chuck Wing Hing said the decision was made based on six factors. They include results from research and surveys that show reservations from citizens and limited coverage of recycling facilities. <laughs> Turks said they should not rush to change the habits of more than 7 million residents, and such environmental policies require long-term efforts. We have spent, well... Secretary for Environment and Ecology Zhe Chin Wen said the government will study ways to optimize the waste charging scheme, including easing the financial burdens of some sectors and individuals, the design of the designated trash bags, and streamlining the operations. It's a great step forward and it's the right idea, but it does lack a bit of foresight because we don't necessarily have the right recycling facilities in Hong Kong. A lot of people think you know, it's very expensive to spend extra money on this. And I even hear some people say, oh, if I don't buy the rubbish, it doesn't matter, I just leave it on the floor. Is the government going to collect it? With the rollback of the August 1st implementation, the government announced a slew of recycling measures. They include doubling the number of food waste recycling bins at public housing estates and other major residential estates citywide within one year. There will be 100 mobile food waste recycling spots set up in each district. Food waste recycling facilities will be set up at 100 refuse collection points as well. The number of community recycling facilities green at community will be increased from 200 to 800 with their working hours extended. The government will consider turning the green money or points collected from recycling items into consumption vouchers. 20 designated trash bags will be handed out to public housing tenants each month for half a year starting next month. Zhe Chi Wen also said they will work with different organizations to step up education and publicity on their environmental policies. He added the government will report the work to relevant panels at the Legislative Council in the middle of 2025. Jackie Lin, TVB News. Six local men and 14 Indonesian women were arrested in connection with suspected money laundering cases involving more than $10 million. The suspects are aged between 29 and 63. Eight of them are believed to be core members of the crime group that allegedly lured foreign domestic helpers to open stooge bank accounts with rewards ranging from $1,000 to $2,500. Between November last year and April this year, at least 17 such accounts were opened. The accounts were allegedly used to launder more than $10 million in criminal proceeds. Authorities say the crime group is also behind 39 scam cases involving $5.4 million. Police are not ruling out more arrests. Residents from eight more mainland cities can travel to Hong Kong under the individual visit scheme starting today. Hong Kong's tourism industry expects these travelers will be overnight visitors and likely spend much more in the SAR than day trippers from other mainland cities. Jackie Lin with details. All eight new additions to the individual visit scheme are provincial capitals, including Taiyuan, as well as capitals of autonomous regions. Some Taiyuan tourists travel to Hong Kong via direct flight right on the first day of the expanded scheme. Free from the requirement to follow a guided tour group now, this tourist says she is spending five days in Hong Kong and she doesn't have a specific itinerary and plans on what to buy in Hong Kong. Shanxi province is famous for its metallurgy and coal mining industry. 
According to data from the National Bureau of Statistics, in 2022, the GDP of Shanxi's provincial capital Taiyuan topped 557 billion yuan, ranking the highest among the eight provincial and regional capitals and the 26th among all mainland cities. Apart from Taiyuan, travelers from Hohod in Inner Mongolia, Harbin in Heilongjiang, Lhasa in Tibet, Urumqi in Xinjiang, Lanzhou in Gansu, Xining in Qinghai, and Ningchuan in Ningxia can now stay for up to seven days at a time in Hong Kong. Some tourism industry representatives believe these visitors with a higher per capita income boast a higher purchasing power than those from other mainland cities currently under the individual visa scheme. Timothy Choi, executive director of the Hong Kong Tourism Association, noted that travelers from these eight cities have to take a flight to reach Hong Kong, so most of them will likely spend a week to ten days when traveling to cities in the southern part of the country. Choi expects each tourist will spend around $6,000 in Hong Kong, as only four of the eight cities have three to four direct flights to Hong Kong per week. The tourism industry hopes more flights can be introduced to maximize the effectiveness of the scheme's expansion. Jackie Lin, TVB News. Premier Lee Chang met with the leaders of South Korea and Japan at a long-awaited trilateral summit in Seoul. It coincided with an announcement from North Korea that the country plans to launch a spy satellite in defiance of UN resolutions which prohibit them using ballistic missiles. David Garrett reports. A three-way conversation around a triangle table, a courteous bow of the head and down to business. South Korea's President Yoon suk yeol opened proceedings, the first three-way talks between China, South Korea and Japan for four years. Just hours earlier, North Korea told the Japanese Coast Guard it plans to launch its second military spy satellite into orbit by June 4th. So as the summit started, Yoon immediately wanted to speak about North Korea. Yun said Pyongyang's actions hurts peace and stability in the region and the world. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida spoke of his concerns, saying a launch by North Korea would be in breach of UN Security Council resolutions. He said Japan strongly urged North Korea not to launch. Kishida then spoke about the importance of the three nations speaking with each other on international subjects. Premier Lee Siang did not mention North Korea directly, instead focusing on the importance of this relationship. <laughs> Lee said this has not changed. The spirit of cooperation formed in responding to crises has not changed. Our common mission to maintain regional prosperity and stability has not changed. Later in a briefing, Lee said Beijing, Tokyo and Seoul would resume negotiations on a trilateral free trade agreement. <laughs> The Premier also said China is committed to maintaining peace on the Korean peninsula and promoting a political settlement. He finished by saying, we hope the parties concerned will exercise restraint. David Garrett, TVB News. In Beijing, the State Council has appointed former Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Hua Chunying as the nation's vice foreign minister. Hua has worked in the foreign ministry for over 30 years and served as its spokesperson for more than a decade. Timothy Lee tells us more. 54-year-old Hua Chunying assumed the position of foreign ministry spokesperson in 2012 and is the fifth woman in the nation's history to serve in that post. Over her years of media exposure in the ministry, Hua became famous for some of her statements. Such as in late 2020, when she responded to accusations of China's alleged wolf warrior diplomacy. She stressed it does not matter if others give China that label, as long as the nation is striving to defend international peace and justice. In 2018, Hua responded to foreign media reports about China spying on former U.S. President Donald Trump on his iPhone. The former foreign ministry spokeswoman said Americans concerned about being spied on via their Apple-made phones should consider switching to using their Huawei counterparts. Hua also called out the U.S. government's positive statements on the 2019 riots in Hong Kong and compared them to the January 6th riots in Washington, D.C. in 2021. In October the same year, Hua was promoted to assistant minister of foreign affairs and was responsible for media, guest and translation work. She began to post more on social media about her work and showcase China's soft power. 
Some of her posts include a photo of President Xi Jinping during his visit to the U.S. in his younger days, as well as a video of Peng Liyuan, President Xi's wife, during her visit to France. Hua was born in Huai'an City in Jiangsu Province in 1970, where her father served as a former secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. After graduating from Nanjing University with a bachelor's degree in English in 1992, Hua joined the foreign ministry and was stationed in countries such as Singapore and in Europe. Hua is the third woman to assume the position of Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs after Wang Hairong and Fu Ying. Timothy Lee, TVB News. In Geneva, the 77th World Health Assembly commenced today, addressing issues related to global health governance and cooperation. At a media briefing over the weekend, Chao Suatao, Deputy Director of China's National Health Commission, stressed China's proactive role in international health organizations, sharing valuable experiences with the global community. Yang Xilun, Minister Counselor of China's Permanent Mission to the United Nations Office in Geneva, addressed a Taiwan-related proposal put forth by a few countries, which is to allow participation at the assembly of a separate delegation representing the Taiwan region. Yang described the proposal as politically manipulative and said China resolutely opposes it. He criticized the actions incited by the Democratic Progressive Party in Taiwan, labeling the proposals as inappropriate and unrealistic. Twelve travelers were injured when a Qatar Airways flight from Doha to Dublin hit severe turbulence over Turkey. It came five days after one person died and more than 40 were injured after a Singapore Airlines plane flying from London to the Lion City encountered severe turbulence, dropped 6,000 feet and had to be diverted to Bangkok. The Qatar Airways Boeing 787 Dreamliner landed safely in Dublin and was met by emergency services. Six of the injured were members of the cabin crew. Qatar Airways is conducting an internal investigation. Passengers said the turbulence lasted around 20 seconds. Powerful storms have killed at least 18 people and injured hundreds in the United States while leaving a wide trail of destruction across Texas, Oklahoma and Arkansas. Tornadoes obliterated homes and a truck stop where people sought shelter in a restroom during the latest deadly weather to strike the central United States. The worst damage was seen in a region spanning from north of Dallas to the northwest corner of Arkansas. The system threatened to bring more violent weather to other parts of the Midwest. By Monday, forecasters say the greatest, the greatest risk will shift to the east, covering a broad area from Alabama to near New York City. In Sinshu, Taiwan, two firefighters died while evacuating residents from a burning high-rise apartment building. The fire broke out at around 11 p.m. Sunday. While the blaze was put out in around 40 minutes, thick smoke continued to spread in the building. The fire allegedly broke out on the first floor due to burning cables. During their search for trapped residents, two firefighters collapsed in a stairwell after their breathing apparatuses ran out of oxygen. They were later certified dead. As of 1 p.m. today, all 351 residents of the building were rescued. In Papua New Guinea, more than 2,000 people could be buried alive by a massive landslide that occurred last week. The UN estimate 670 were killed in the mountainous interior. The landslide crashed through Yambali, a village in the north of the country, at around 3 a.m. on Friday when most people were sleeping. Survivors searched through tons of earth and rubble Sunday looking for missing relatives. The treacherous terrain has made it difficult to get aid to the site and has made it difficult to find survivors. Local officials said around 50 stores, a school, hotels and houses had all vanished. Emergency responders were moving survivors to safer ground on Sunday as unstable earth and tribal warfare which is rife in the country's highlands, threatened the rescue effort. 
Owing to the rise of heavy rainfall in recent years, the Geotechnical Engineering Office said it will roll out a new landslide warning system to help residents avoid such risks. Timothy Lee has more. Several areas in Hong Kong suffered from serious cases of landslides when the Black Rainstorm Warning Signal was issued last year. The Geotechnical Engineering Office noted it recorded an average of 300 cases of landslides annually in the past 35 years, but the figure rose to over 600 last year. The observatory has already issued two red rainstorm warning signals this year and began issuing severe rainstorm warnings in areas with particularly heavy rainfall. In a bid to tackle the rising landslide problem, authorities will roll out a new landslide warning system. Shem Kawa, deputy head of the Geotechnical Engineering Office, said the warning system will be similar to that of the observatory's severe rainstorm warnings. Prerequisites for issuing the new landslide warning include an accumulation of rainfall reaching above 300 to 400 millimeters within 24 hours and unfavorable geographical conditions. Authorities have used robots and other laser scanning technology to inspect some 500 artificial slopes last year as part of their measure to combat the landslide problem. The government emphasized such repair work will be completed before the end of the month. Timothy Lee, TVB News. Thanks for watching. Pearl Magazine is up next. Bye.